I'm very pleased to be asked to um, uh, help launch the MSc in Climate Change Management and uh, Finance. Um, the next generation of leaders, the next generation of teachers should know about uh, climate change as a matter of their basic ed education. Uh, with overcoming poverty, it's the uh, defining challenge of this century. Um, my view is that if we fail on one, we will fail on the other. So I'm going to tell the story as a story about um, development, ri raising living standards, uh, managing climate as intertwined, uh, two parts of the same thing. Of course, how they're intertwined, how that happens is extremely important and what policies you put in place to make that uh, work well, that, those are issues of great importance. But it's something that they, all students should know about. Indeed, all people should know about it. Just as all people should know something about India and China because they're such a big part of humankind, everybody should know something about climate change because it's such a big part of our future. And building it into courses like this is very important. We have a course called LSE 100 at London School of Economics, which um, we make compulsory for all first-year students. It doesn't matter if they're doing... Uh, law or finance or economics or, or whatever, and which are about thinking like a social scientist. And I do a couple of hours on climate change on that, um, but tell them actually I was telling you all about how to understand risk, you know, type one and uh, type two errors which are uh, ev everywhere here, um, how to think about <laughs> upper tails of uh, distributions and so on. So uh, we do that as it were, as we teach them about technique and concept. So it's application of technique and concept, but above all, it's a fundamental challenge of our time. So I'm delighted that you're putting that course together. It, I'm trying at the LSE to get climate change and environment everywhere, which is a, as it should be, international relations, law, finance, uh, geography, uh, anthropology, wherever you go, uh, the environment and climate change um, are, are present and of course my own subject economics. It takes a little while but uh, you're obviously bringing Grantham Imperial and your business school together and this is a key uh, mechanism, a key instrument for making that happen. So congratulations on launching your MSc on climate change management and finance. Now the title of what I'm going to say is the title of um, the book which I published in May which you can buy and I'll sign after the, uh, <laughs> the lecture. Um, and uh, I don't know if I could put my thumbprint on your Kindle or, or whatever. But, um, but I'll, I'll tilt what I have to say a bit towards Paris because many of you will know that there's a big uh, international meeting in Paris at the end of November, beginning of December, which is intended to put together an agree international agreement on climate change. It's sort of a, a rerun of a... Uh, a, a somewhat chaotic and quarrelsome attempt that was, took place in Copenhagen in 2009. This one, there will be an agreement, but I mean, I, I say reasonably confidently, there will be an agreement, but of course, what sort of agreement and uh, uh, what will be its faults, what will be its virtues, uh, what should we try to do between now and then? I'll, I'll say something right at the end of what, uh, what I have to uh, say. So I've already said that uh, development and climate change are intertwined um, and uh, that takes me to uh, my first slide and I've basically already given the guts of what I want to say there. Um, managing climate change and overcoming poverty, uh, my view, the two defining challenges of this century and if we fail on one, we will fail on the other. Clearly, if we fail to manage climate change, we create an environment uh, so destructive and so hostile that we will reverse the gains in development that we have made. And I'll say something more about why it's reasonable to think that way. But on the other hand, if we try to manage climate change by putting barriers in the way of development over the next two or three decades, we will not have the coalition that we need to manage climate change. So if we fail on one, we fail on the other. Well, the good news is that we can, see that we can succeed on both, and how we do that is a big part of what um, 
I have to say. Now, I've, there, are, uh, there are 20 some slides in this slide pack. I can't go through them all, but the slide pack will be available on the Imperial Business School website. And so what I'm going to do is to go through, um, give you the story, pick on a few slides along the way, because I was told I had roughly half an hour or so and we want to uh, have time for questions. But the story itself, I think, should be moderately clear from the longer slide pack. Indeed, I hope it's moderately clear from what I have to say, but I'll only be putting up, <laughs> I'll only be putting up uh, a few of the slides. Now, um, first is, I'm assuming you know basically about how the greenhouse effect occurs. Um, greenhouse gases oscillate um, at frequencies which interfere with infrared um, radiation coming out from the Earth's surface, having come in as uh, solar radiation, and that's the greenhouse effect. They trap. And of course, what defines a greenhouse gas is whether it does oscillate at the frequencies that trap um, the leaving or the attempted leaving infrared. That's uh, that something was being trapped, goes back to Fourier in the 1820s. What it was that was doing the trapping was uh, uh, Tyndall in the mid uh, 19th century. Arrhenius did back of the envelope calculations which were pretty good and what the magnitude of these effects would be and by the middle of the last <coughs> century or slightly before the way it happened, the oscillation of molecules uh, was pretty clear. So this is basic simple science, um, clear even to an economist uh, like, like me. So this is, and then the data piled in. So the basic ideas were there uh, the initial data were there because Fourier discovered that the w world was warmer than it should have been and assumed there was some, tr from a heat balance uh, examination, so he, he assumed some trapping was going on. So all the way, with those concepts being built up, um, you had a solid theory with some evidence, but then the evidence came piling in and it's just overwhelming now uh, on the magnitude of uh, this effect and just how could how big it could be. All these things are stochastic in the sense that uh, we can't say exactly what will happen because the world's a complicated place, but we can say something reasonably strong on distributions and the kind of risks that we might be running. And the kind of risks we might be running are enormous. Now, it's human activities that emit these greenhouse gases. They're flows that go into concentrations or stock. So we've got a flow stock uh, process here with the stocks, the concentrations being <coughs> the issue and of course uh, human beings started off by emitting greenhouse gases but it all comes back to bite them because the climate change has its direct impacts on humans. So it starts with humans and the impacts are on humans. So it's very important just a very quick recap because the policy issues that arise from that process are obviously very difficult from the way in which I've described it. The first is the potentially immense scale and I'll say a little bit about that in just a moment, but we risk uh, on current paths three, three and a half, four degrees or more in the next hundred years or so of increase in global sur average global surface temperature above the end of the 19th century, which is the usual benchmark um, because that was before the really strong hydrocarbon fueled growth kicked in. Now, we haven't been at three degrees centigrade um, uh, plus above the end of the 19th century and average global surface temperature for perhaps three million years. We haven't been at four degrees centigrade um, for perhaps tens of millions of years. Now it really doesn't matter for this argument whether it's two and a half million years or four million years for three degrees centigrade or 10 or 15 or 30 million years ago for four or five degrees centigrade. The point is that in historical time these are massive and we have our civilization is from the Holocene period since we warmed up after the last ice age and temperature has been in a very narrow range, plus or minus one roughly. We're already on the edge of that. We're already at the borderline of temperatures um, associated with human civilization in the sense of cultivating crops, waiting for them to um, come to fruition, come to harvest, so you sit and you wait, so you're stationary and then you have a surplus, so you can have journalists and academics and all those 
things. So that's our civilization. It's the last seven, eight, nine thousand years. We're on the edge of the temperatures associated with that. Two degrees is already uh, on, you know, it's considerably outside that range. Uh, three, four degrees, way, way outside what humans of any kind, let alone since uh, the last ice age. Human beings, quarter of a million years, roughly speaking, 250,000. And we're talking about three or four degrees centigrade, three million <coughs> years for three degrees, tens of millions of years for four degrees, <coughs> way outside human experience. If you look from the scientists at the kind of things that could happen, it is um, southern Europe could look like the Sahara Desert. We're seeing evidence uh, of the uh, likely melting of land ice, which would see sea levels grow up, go up uh, really quite quickly, as opposed to the warming of the oceans, which means they uh, go up quite slowly. But that sliding of land ice into the sea could see them going up very quickly. These are potentially very big effects. Big parts of the world underwater. When we were last to when we were last two degrees centigrade, the uh, <coughs> sea levels were perhaps five, six, seven metres above where we are now. Now, these things take time, but if the ice sheets slide in, that time is accelerated. So, this is a story of immense scale. And when people say, oh, well, you know, we've got time, let's go slowly, then it's all about wind and weather, isn't it? The, uh <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, scale uncertainty, all, lots of, all this is stochastic, long lags, it takes time for these things to happen, and the cause is the sum total of all the emissions. It's what we call in economics public goods or public bads. It's not just what you do, it's the sum total of what everybody does. Immense scale, risk and uncertainty, long lags, publicness. Four things that humans are very bad at dealing with. It couldn't, the science has conspired, it's all your fault, the science has conspired to make this just about as difficult as it could be as a policy question because of the scale, the risk, the lags and the publicness. Never mind, we have to um, tackle it because if we don't, we're in such deep trouble. So that's the story. We're about 450 parts per million CO2 equivalent now, CO2 plus equivalent in CO2 and the other greenhouse gases. We're adding about two and a half parts per million a year. Um, that two and a half parts per million a year is still going up. So 100 years of that, well, 100 times three, say, per year, because it's two and a half and rising. So something like business as usual would add 300 to the 450, and that would be 750. And that would be, if that stayed that way at 750 parts per million uh, concentrations of CO2 equivalent, you're talking about very high temperatures you know, for more than four. Now that was um, climate change modelling done by just a little bit of arithmetic. But you, you don't have to have very fancy models to follow that arithmetic. And we were going up, um, I around the Second World War, we were going up about half a part per million a year. We're now going up by two and a half parts per million a year, and that's rising. So you can see where it's going. Now, in, in, enough of that story, but it is very important to understand the scale, the risk, the lags, and the publicness if you're going to think about policy and uh, getting things done. So let me go now to the second part of what uh, I have to say. That's just to prove the slides really are there. <laughs> so the second part of what I have to say is about the urgency. I've spoken about the magnitude of the problem, just how big and important it is. Now, where there's uncertainty, sometimes it's sensible to wait and see if the uncertainty is <coughs> resolved. That is true of some problems, but it's not true of this one. The reason it's not true of this one is because it's a flow-stop process. It's a ratchet effect. The longer you leave it, the more the concentrations have gone up, the more difficult the starting point. But there's another reason why delay is dangerous, and that's because um, emissions are associated with, a lot of it, capital and infrastructure, the way we do things. I mean, it, a coal-fired uh, power station, God forbid, one shouldn't even talk about these things, but a coal-fired power station would last for a very long time, three, four hundred years. A lot of how we emit depends on the way in which our cities work. Cities are absolutely crucial 
to all this? Well, we live in a city where some of the roads were laid out by the Romans and then we put the underground railway under some of those roads. Um, now I'm sure the Romans didn't anticipate that they were charting some of the railway lines. But it, the point here is how long the lags can be. So it's not just the ratchet effect, which is very important, the flow to the stocks, the emissions, the concentrations. It's also that we have great danger of lock-in. And um, I'll come back to, well, let me come to it now. Um, it, the importance of lock-in is absolutely fundamental here. We are now about 50% of the world's population in cities, with a population of around seven and a bit billion people. We're a bit over ballpark three and a half billion people in our cities. We will, by mid-century, it'll be about 70%, and the population will be over nine billion. So, well, multiply 0.7 by nine and a bit billion, you're talking about six and a half billion people. Now in terms of demographic and economic forecast, actually, that's pretty solid. We can have a pretty good statement about both the fraction and the population. Three and a half billion to six and a half billion. After that, it will probably flatten off because the proportion in cities has gone up and the population will stabilise. This happens only once in human existence. Three and a half billion in cities to six and a half billion. And in the next 35 years, and the pattern of those cities laid out in the next 20. This is enormously urgent. If we make a mess of the next 20, 25 years in terms of building our cities and energy systems, because a lot of our energy systems because of the income levels that a lot of these countries are going through, a lot of our energy systems are going to be built in that time too. <coughs> it's also 20 or 30 years in which the uh, future of our forests will in large measure be determined. This next 20 years is absolutely fundamental. <coughs> so the urgency of this story and the dangers of delay are all too infrequently understood. So we're setting off on the right road. Let's do what we can. Well, I mean, it's better than not setting off on the right road and not doing what you can, but it often carries some notion that, you know, it'll sort it itself out, we'll move along. This is, doesn't work that way. This is the, air, the emissions, it's the sum total of emissions that count. It's the area under the curve. And if you pack in a lot of area under the curve, total emissions integrated, now, you've got to be very strong later, or you start moving into three or four degrees. So that sense of urgency is something which I think is analytically obvious, but politically and practically all too often over overlooked. So it's an immense effect. The action is urgent. What about the scale of the action. Now, um, the, uh, sorry, basically, um, because of what I've said already, and I'll say a little bit about this in a moment, but we're now about 50 billion tonnes CO2 equivalent now in 2015, 5051. If you look at the promises for Paris, and I'll be coming back to Paris right at the end of what I have to say, if you look at the promises for Paris, they are essentially um, around... Um, what just stopped me for a moment is that there's a new slide on the front, so all my numbering of the slides are off by one, so I, it's not hard mental arithmetic, but... Uh, <laughs> When my notes say go to slide 13, they actually mean 13 plus 1. So <laughs> if you think that was the reason for a little bit of hesitation, I had my front slide and then there was another front slide put on. Why would you care about that? But it, it just a <laughs> <laughs> So basically, if you look at what's happening in Paris, uh, we can see where it's going because the intended nationally determined contributions, which is rather wordy language for where do you think you're going to go in 2030, um, those numbers are mostly in. We can see where it's going and it's going to be between 55 and 60. I hope it's 55 rather than more, but it's roughly where it's going to be. <coughs> for a two degree path given where we are at about 50 uh, uh, 
sorry, it's going to be 50 to 60 gigaton CO2 equivalent as a flow, given where we are now at about 50, 51 as a flow in 2015. Um, that's a considerable increase. Uh, we should be coming down by about 20%. For a two-degree path starting where we are, we should be down to about uh, 40 uh, billion tonnes CO2 equivalent in uh, 2030. So we're very high relative to what a sensible two-degree path would look like starting from now. Now, that means, because we're too high now, and will be for the next 15 years or more, um, we're going to be, have to be pretty drastic at the uh, uh, second half of this century. <coughs> it roughly speaking means um, uh, zero emissions from electricity around mid-century and zero total emissions by the end of the century. Zero total emissions. That's just looking at the total flow of emissions, the area under curve, the sum total over time, and saying if we exhaust a lot of it now, we're going to have to get, have to get down very low. Uh, later on. What does very low mean? Well, if you do the arithmetic, um, it, uh, it means zero before the end of the century. We can do zero because there's some places, are gonna, some bits of the world, some bits of the economy are going to be positive, it means other bits are going to have to be negative. We know how to do negative. Um, you, you can have biofuels with carbon capture and storage. You can store carbon in soil. I mean, regrading of a lot of degraded land makes a lot of sense. You can have, uh, you can regrade and reforest. Regrade your forests and reforest. And there are some lovely people like Klaus Lackner and uh, Vinod Kostler and others who are planning on sucking the CO2 out of the atmosphere. Um, it's a bit of magic and good luck to them and I hope it works. But there are... <laughs> I have, a, I have a very dear Catholic friend who, friend who is a wonderful uh, ec economist on climate called Otmar Edenhofer. He started life as a Jesuit. And he put his arm around me and he said, I'm a Catholic, Nick, you understand? And I said, well, I'm not sure I do, but you, you go on. And um, <laughs> he, he said, I said, I, I believe in miracles. And I said, well, good. And he said, but you know, Nick, he said, I've come not to rely on them. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> so you know, I... I think sucking the CO2 out of the air on scale may be miraculous, but uh, you can do it. And, but there are these four ways, really. Now, the, the first three of these could be considerable. We've got work to do. To work out. We've got to look at the numbers. How big could it be? Does it make sense? But I just wanted to emphasize that we're so high now that to have a reasonable chance of holding the two degrees, we've got to be zero by the end of the century. And, of course, as many of you know now, um, we can burn uncaptured. Um, perhaps a half of the hydrocarbon reserves that we uh, already know about, let alone the reserves which people are rather misguidedly looking for. Um, so what I've said is scale of risk, urgency of action, and now I've said something about the scale of action. So essentially we're going to have to be radical and revolutionary in the way we do things. Now, the good news is that when you do that sort of thing, you discover, you innovate, you create, you invest, and you grow. So I want to be very clear that this is a uh, growth story. If you look back at the great waves of technological innovation, yeah, I just said how big it's all going to be, and now I'm going to get really cheerful and think about what it means and... Uh, uh, how exciting it could be. This is obviously very diagram diagrammatic. Don't worry about the vertical axis. But <coughs> essentially you're talking about big waves of industrial activity or waves of technological change. And uh, across since the Industrial Revolution and the mechanisation of textiles to steam and railways, middle of the 19th century, <coughs> steam and electricity, end of the 19th century, uh, automobiles, mass production, the beginning of the last century, and we're in um, information and telecoms now, and of course, uh, uh, clean tech, materials, biotech. Technical progress is faster than it has ever been. You're seeing massive change in digital. Who knows how far we're into the digital revolution? We've probably only just begun. You've got the uh, extraordinary change in materials and biotechnology. Uh, three things going on at the same time. The combination will make life um, uh, really exciting. And this is a story of um, innovation 
and uh, growth. That's the first part of the uh, cheerfulness. Um, the this adding one to everything is really <laughs> annoying. Isn't it? it should be, it should be really easy. Um, anyway, I'm going to say. I'm going to say something about this for a moment. Um, I've said how exciting discovery will be, so that the change will bring its own innovation and investment. There's another reason why this is very important and very exciting. In the last three or four years, we've come to understand the magnitude of the deaths around the world from air pollution. And the smaller the particles are, the nastier they are. You know, the easier they find it to go through your nostrils and your tonsils and so on and embed themselves on your lungs. PM 2.5 in particular, and smaller, is really dangerous. Now, what's happened is that satellite observation has allowed us to uh, see just how widespread these pollutants are. And uh, the medics have started epidemiologically and directly in terms of how these things work on your body, has started to help us understand just how big some of these effects are. Around the world, we're probably killing <coughs> well over three million a year with external air pollution, pollution and external air pollution, probably a bit more on internal air pollution. So it's not simply that managing climate change from burning less fossil fuels saves lives down the track, because we know that lives down the track in terms of people being dislodged and moving could be hundreds of millions, perhaps billions on the move in conflict. It's also saving lives now by burning less uh, fossil fuels on a very big scale. And because China was greatly taken by this new evidence, they started measuring much more intensively locally. And they, um, uh, and a group in Berkeley, Berkeley Earth, took the Chinese-generated data, because uh, uh, much more detailed locally, and they came to the conclusion that breathing in ch most Chinese cities were like smoking 40 a day. Man, woman and child. The children, nev <coughs> children never recover. Uh, it's permanent damage. I mean, this is very big. Th these issues are enormously big. India, where I've spent much of my working life, I'm working 40 years in India, 25 years in China, India is much worse. And the Supreme Court here in the UK accepted a 29,000 deaths a year from air pollution in the UK. It was about three or four months ago. Lord Carnworth, the Supreme Court Justice who led this, accepted those numbers. That's 15 times more killed than killed by road accidents. 15 times. If road accident, they're about 1,700 a year. If road accidents doubled, we'd be shocked and would accept all sorts of change to stop it. 15 times more in this country. So I think one thing that argument started to see, help to see what the benefits of change are, beyond the innovation and industrial revolution story that I told, is this uh, issue around uh, air pollution. In order to um, make progress, we're going to have to invest strongly in infrastructure. In order to invest strongly in infrastructure, we've got to have um, much clearer policy. And you, some of you will notice that George Osborne instituted a National Infrastructure Commission uh, a week or so ago. I'm not saying I agree with all this government's policies. I, there are some that I have rather serious reservations about. But the, that was a step forward because what we <coughs> need with infrastructure investment is clarity, as much clarity as you can give. Certainty is not on offer, but you can have less uncertainty. And government-induced policy risk is the biggest deterrent to, to investment around the world, particularly in infrastructure, which is very long-lasting. So I can't go into lots of detail about the nature of this uh, industrial revolution, the nature of this radical change. Infrastructure is going to be at its core. Planning for infrastructure and policies around it will be very important. And so too will be the uh, financial system and how finance moves to this area. And of course, this course will be in large measure about finance. The finance is absolutely critical. Uh, the city of Chicago can borrow at 1%, the city of Sao Paulo can borrow at 8%, or if you like, basis points, 100 basis points <coughs> in Chicago, 800. 
That makes an enormous difference to what people can do. If you can cut the real cost of capital from 6% to 3%, you transform the competitiveness of renewables, which are largely capital, because the, the input, the sunshine or whatever it is, is largely for free. So finance might be boring and uh, risk-induced basis points can turn a lot of people off. But David Miles here in the front row knows all about this stuff. I was involved in the setting up the Green Investment Bank as well as working in the World Bank. This is at the heart of the story, to bring down the cost of capital and uh, good policies and development banks are part of uh, that story. And I hope and expect and I'm arguing for the resurgence of development banks as part of this overall story. Now, I can't go into much detail, but good policy and good finance, as well as very strong investment in innovation and technology, will be all part of um, <coughs> this story. So, too, will be sensible pricing for carbon. So, too, will be direct regulation on the kind of air pollution that we've got. You can see, just by thinking about basic issues of market failure, what are the big policy instruments you should be pushing. And uh, I've already mentioned many of them, but I haven't exhausted the kinds of policy instruments. So I've tried to talk about the radical change, how big it has to be, how fast it has to be, but I've also given, I hope, an optimistic story about what we can do because it, and the policies that are involved in actually doing it. So let me end with uh, saying something about Paris. <coughs> so basically, I'm extremely optimistic about what we can do but I wouldn't say I'm optimistic that we will do it. But I do think that being showing a plausible evidence-based story about the problem and about what you can do is a logical prerequisite for convincing people to do it. So you have to build it up that way. So how can we move? I see it's getting slightly more political now because this is about the Paris uh, process. Essentially, um, I've already said that the uh, understanding that you can combine growth and climate responsibility is fundamental. And I've tried to argue that. I've been able to do it only very briefly, but we had a commission which I co-chaired with Felipe Calderon, which published a uh, report called Better Growth, Better Climate just one year ago, building up that story of combining uh, economic advance, sustainable development, overcoming poverty on the one hand, and climate responsibility on the other. That's why we called it Better Growth better climate. So we have to make that case because all too often people say, well, I'm not sac sacrificing growth now for a bit of this climate responsibility stuff that I don't understand anyway. That, I think we're making progress in overcoming that particular problem. But we have to, cha we have to translate that into the political realities of Paris. I've already spoken about the gap, the 55 or 60 that uh, countries are collectively forecasting um, billion tonnes CO2 <coughs> equivalent for 2030, with the 40 or so where we should really be in 2030. So that, I take it, as actually defining now what we have to do in Paris, because we're not going to change that 55 to 60 very much. <clears throat> I hope it's 55 rather than 60 and we have to work to bring it down, but it's not going to change very much. Those are on the table already. So that immediately defines the test of success in Paris. The test of success in Paris is the credibility of processes for ramping up that ambition. That's the test. So what's involved there? Well, investing in innovation. Um, <clears throat> David King and a few of us, um, myself, Gus O'Donnell, Martin Rees, and Adair Turner and others, uh, John Brown. Um, actually, we teased David King. It was one night and six lords, but he doesn't mind uh, that. <laughs> the, um, we proposed the Apollo program for investing much more strongly in uh, renewables, particularly solar, particularly storage, to make um, solar powered um, power stations uh, cheaper than coal fired, even without carbon tax um, in the next six or seven years. We believe that to be possible. So one measure of the credibility of Paris is how far it gets behind innovation and R&D. It's making some progress. Bill Gates has said he'll put in a billion dollars if others put in money as well. So it's not just 
public sector, although I hope the public sector will be uh, very strong on that. So that's one part of the story. Will we see the kind of finance that I started to describe coming through? The infrastructure investment that the world will need to make to build the cities, as I've described, to build the energy systems, will be five or six trillion dollars a year. It's about three trillion dollars now. It'll be rising, and the question is, will we have good policies so that is good infrastructure investment? Will we have um, finance with a kind of lower interest rates, lower cost of capital, which would enable that overall scale to come through, whilst at the same time tipping the balance as a lower real interest would towards renewables with their greater capital intensity. These are the kinds of ways in which the credibility of the ramp up process should be tested. And of course people have to be willing to put their own experience and their own <coughs> results on the table for others to criticise and to learn from. So these will be the key areas. So that's my story of uh, Paris in order for people to make the commitments, they'll have to have the confidence in the kind of areas of action, innovation, finance, building the infrastructure and so on that I described. So I think we're going to get an agreement in Paris, and I think most of us are pretty confident we'll get an agreement in Paris. Now, it's not as quarrelsome and nasty going into this as it was in Copenhagen. The text that's going to be agreed is pretty well known now. Nobody knew what it was, and there were different versions of it going around. I've been to all of these things since 2006, and the, the production of text in Copenhagen was really chaotic, and it was really cold. I mean, it was a no, there was n there was nothing nothing there to make it uh, make it work. It was cold, chaotic, and quarrelsome. It's much better. I don't know what the temperature in, in November in Paris is going to be, but the. This is a story now where people have got together much better. It's much more structured. The United States and China really want an agreement and the presidents have got together. And the people negotiating for the US and China will be under instruction from their presidents to get somewhere. This is a different uh, story. I think we will have an agreement. But I've said that it's going to be way too high for two degrees in 2030. And the big test is how will we put in place convincing mechanisms to accelerate from there? My answer to that is probably, but uh, that's what, and I'm directly involved in, in a number of ways, that's what many of us are, are working on. Thank you very much. from Marks and Spencer. As a businessman, a price on carbon seems a, a very powerful way of driving the growth opportunities you've spoken about. Do you agree and do you think we'll get a price on carbon coming out of Paris? Um, definitely, I agree. Um, I don't think a price of carbon will come directly out of Paris because um, that's not what they're negotiating over. Um, will a good agreement in Paris make it more likely that countries by country people adopt a carbon price, I think it will. How likely? We're going to have to find out. But as you know very well, most responsible firms now do use an internal carbon price. I don't know what M&S is, is, and I don't know if you're allowed to reveal it publicly. But you know, many of them are using 40 dollars $50, $60 a tonne. You know, at $50, $60 a tonne, carbon capture and storage is probably going to work. And make, you know, it, it, that would transform the, the story. So the more that business people ask for it, the more convincing Paris is in, in terms of ramping up emissions, the more that business people um, uh, do it internally and let, let it be known, and they do let it be known, then I think it could start to progress. China next year is going to have a nationwide uh, carbon market. Um, uh, I was on a panel with Christine Lagarde in the IMF uh, meetings uh, in Peru last week and uh, she was pushing very strongly for that. Um, Mark Carney, I know he's not Chancellor of the Exchequer, but who knows, um, <laughs> was um, pushed very strongly for this, uh, this kind of policy in a very good speech he made uh, on the stability implications of not tackling 
climate change. So, and indeed the stability implications of tackling climate change through what might happen to the value of hydrocarbon companies. It was a very thoughtful, carefully researched speech. You, we're moving quite well in that direction, but you can sense my frustration. We're moving in good directions. We're not moving anywhere near fast enough. And so this is a process of acceleration, and I hope you guys will... I know you do speak up on this, but keep speaking up. Even louder, is he? No, even clearer, I should say. Challenge accepted. Yeah, OK. But thank you. Another question. Sir, could you give us some in insight, please, into the recent government announcements um, relating to renewable energy, which have all come <laughs> very unexpectedly to us after the election, with major cuts to all the renewables and green energy support, and yet major increases in support for oil and gas? And to what extent do you think this will undermine our country's position in Paris? Um. I, I don't speak, I mean, I'm a crossbench member of the Lords and I'm, not, I'm no part of any government. I, I worked for Her Majesty for three years in, um, up to 2007, but not as a politician. Um, I, I tell you a little bit of what they tell me and I ask you to think. Um, there, was a lot of messy, there were a lot of messy policies. Um, and so there was some reason for sorting out and rationalising. Solar, for example, had come down in cost dramatically. This seems to be something to celebrate. It's a success of the kind of policies that have been followed in Europe, including here, particularly in Germany. And of course, China going to scale. So yes, there was a somewhat of a mess to <coughs> sort out, and yes, some of the costs had come down, and that was good, successful policy that they came down. So it makes sense to reduce your support as the costs come down, but it's very important to do that in a predictable way, and a measured way that's related to the fall in, in costs. Now, um, one hears, let me put it not too specifically, um, one hears that some policies to replace the more messy ones that have been sorted out will be arriving. I tell you what I hear. Do I know? I, I don't know. Um, but I hope they do. I'm on the record on the Today programme of describing putting a carbon tax on renewables as um, absolutely potty, um, because it's absolutely potty. And, uh, I mean, why would you put a carbon tax on stuff that doesn't e emit any carbon? I mean, um, But I think the story of rationalisation and replacement is tenable. And let's see. I think the commitment to the carbon targets is genuine, both from David Cameron and from George Osborne. I think that's genuine. So I think, let's see. I, I, I'm not rushing the judgment, but I think one has to keep reminding of the direction we need to go. And the key thing is the credibility of our emissions reductions. That's the key thing. The UK has done pretty well, actually, relative to other countries <coughs> on combining growth and emissions reductions over the last 30 years or so. So if the commitment is still there to those emissions reductions, let them work out good ways to do it, and the students in this course will help them. Question just behind. This is a traditional solar Kyoto University London office. The, uh, I imagine that this event or lecture is the, uh, related to the uh, launch of the MSc course. And so the, what do you expect or give the, uh, or how to educate, or what kind of uh, human resource are you going to uh, educate in uh, the imperial business? Well, all I can do is, is wish the teachers luck. It's not. Uh. <laughs> My, my teaching is at London School of Economics, and maybe we can share some teaching. Who knows? That's the kind of question we should, uh, we, we, we should look at. But I'm fully confident in the people who... You know, you, you've got a very... The Grantham Institute here is very strong. It's where I go to when I don't understand something on the climate science. The, um, it's very strong in business, Imperial. It's very strong in 
finance, so I would have thought that the basic material for teaching the course is indeed here. I'll say a word or two about it uh, uh, shortly. Another, another question for me. Sir, first of all, thank you for the great presentation. Uh, my question is about the need for investment in adaptation. Uh, as you said, investment levels for mitigation are insufficient, but if we judge uh, investments in adaptation at, at present levels are completely inexistent. So my question would be, how do you think we could facilitate uh, capital flows for investments that protect assets and operations from the growing impacts of climate change? I think it's, uh, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, we, we, the, the possibility that we go to three degrees is very real. And uh, we can't, I say that with some sadness, but it's, it's, I've described how we could and should hold to two degrees, and I believe we can. And I've tried to describe how we can. But two degrees itself is very risky and way outside the Holocene period that we've experienced up to now. Three degrees, as I've tried to argue. You know, much of southern Europe might be, might be like the Sahara Desert. I mean, that's a pretty radical stuff to adjust to. Different parts of the world will be battered by storms. Uh, we all know that the Thames Barrage was um, built to be used a few times a decade. It's used a few times a year. I haven't got the numbers. Probably somebody here has got them. I mean, those, um, uh, those are very big effects. And you have to invest to do it. One way to encourage the investment is to try to be as public as you can about what the risks are so that the insurance takes it into account and the uh, city and infrastructure design takes it into account. But life is going to be more costly because of this and uh, people are going to have to take responsibility for looking after themselves. I mean, if your house is subject to subsidence, then it's your job to, to fix it. But what you'd want from your surveyor is to inform you as to what the risks on your house are, and then you decide whether to underpin it or not, and, and so on. And similarly here, we need as, best in, as good information as we possibly can on what the risks are. Um, some of the investment will be public, like the Thames, you wouldn't want to decentralise or privatise this, I hope not, the, the Thames Barrage. Yeah? But other investments are going to have to be uh, private. But for both of them, you need clear and strong information about just how risky it's getting. Question. And of course, in developing countries, so much, so much uh, worse. But there, there's lots of things you can do. I mean, system of rights intensification in developing countries saves water saves energy because you don't flood the fields so much and you don't have so much methane uh, coming out of it and it's more robust <coughs> against uh, difficult weather conditions. So a lot of the things you can do are actually mitigation, adaptation, development tied together. Lots of things in architecture, lots of things in transport uh, like that. So it's very important not to pull these things apart too much but to think of these things going on at the same time. Um, but you mentioned earlier um, the focus on, on trying to incentivize development banks to um, take more initiative in this space. Um, what would be interesting to hear are your thoughts on where exactly um, they could intervene, particularly in, in the support not only of climate change more widely, but specifically within the extractive industries. So where are the areas that they can intervene in um, mineral and hydrocarbon rich countries um, looking across developing nations in South America, Africa and Asia? Yeah, m most of um, what I was speaking to was the importance of the infrastructure investment. And the question you ask is also very important and it, it would cross over to the one I was putting, um, for example, around coal-fired power stations. And very few respectable development banks now would fund a coal-fired power station. Um, the, um, but the big story that I was trying to focus on was the one that was about the building of the clean infrastructure, the clean cities and so on, and getting the right policies and bringing down the cost of capital for that. On mining, um, 
Well, there's a lot of ways in which you can um, make mining much cleaner. Uh, I just got back from Chile on Sunday afternoon. It's ever such a long way. And um, where I went to after the IMF World Bank meetings. You know, the, the, in northern Chile, they've got just about the best conditions for solar on the planet because the site near to the equator, so your angles are right, and uh, it's very clear skies and, uh, and, and so on. Very little cloud. And that's where a lot of copper mines are, or close, close by. A lot of the material extraction is very intensive in electricity, and a lot of the material conversion. I mean, aluminium is nearly all electricity in terms of cost. So um, by locating your um, uh, renewable energies close to some of these activities, I think you can make uh, a, very big, uh, a very big difference. So I think there's great potential there um, to make a, a very big difference. But of course, as I mentioned, you know, those solars, solar stations are very capital intensive. Uh, so you're going to need to bring down the cost of capital to make this work. But you should bring down the cost of capital because the cost of capital is so low. It's absolutely on the floor. <coughs> now when you've got a big need for investment, you've got fantastic technical change, and interest rates as low as they've been since the 1930s or early, that's the moment when you should be investing in your capital intensive uh, industries and doing it in a clean way because of the problem that we face on climate change. Thank you. I know a lot of people uh, have got um, uh, arms up for questions. I can only take one more. Uh, and uh, you've written a lot about discount rates in the past, and you just talked about cost of capital on a couple of occasions. It seems as though in the private sector, the cost of capital is based on this notion of a risk-free rate, which seems a bit ironic in the context of climate change. In the public sector, we're using 3.5% public sector discount rate, and have been doing throughout the development of the climate change problem. I wonder whether you could give some insight into how we change the paradigm of those two areas. It's very important to understand this, to go back to the meaning of discounting. Um, discounting is about relative prices, relative prices between something now and something later. So we call that the discount factor. You know, the, the, the price of a unit of a numeraire um, in the future relative to the price of that numeraire now is the discount factor. And its rate of fall is the discount rate. And it clearly depends on the point in time, and it clearly depends on the good that you're talking about. But to phrase it that way immediately draws your attention to this is a relative price. The discount factor is a relative price between this good stuff later on, 10 years, 100 years, whatever it is, and now. So we're used to thinking about what relative prices depend on. Relative prices in large measure depend on scarcity. So if we think that the future generation could be much worse off than now because of our negligence on climate change, then a unit of output in the future would be more valuable than a unit of output now. So they're endogenous. They depend on what we do. They're not something you can pull off the shelf. You've got to ask where is the economy going and where is the economy going dependent on the decisions we take now. So when you put it that way you recognize that if we behave recklessly we should be dealing with discount rates which are negative because the, the second point I would make and it, I discuss it at great length I think in chapter five at the book in the book is pure time discounting. Now Pure time discounting is um, the discounting of future lives. So I uh, say so what I mean by that. You imagine two people, one born 35 years after the other, but by hypothesis exactly the same in terms of the consumption and everything else that matters about their lives. Identical indi ind individuals on all relevant respects, including all their consumptions, except one's born 35 years later. Pure time discounting at 2% would make that second individual half as valuable as the first 
individual. There's no ethical framework that I can understand that would justify doing that. Whether you think of um, equality of human rights or human lives or rights to development, basic uh, utilitarian frameworks, uh, the Kantian story of <coughs> ethics, which it asks explicitly about what if other people behave the same way. The, whichever, or Aristotelian virtue ethics, whichever ethical framework you bring to that table, I haven't heard a serious argument as to why you should do that. Yet, pure time discount rates are very common. That treasury, three or three and a half percent, comes roughly, it usually comes um, with a two percent growth rate, an elasticity of the market utility of income, which is one, and a pure time discount rate of 1.5. The only way you can justify that pure time discount rate, in my view, is to take a very narrow view of a cost-benefit analysis where it is actually a substitute for risk analysis. Well, the kind of thing I'm doing wouldn't substitute the risk analysis, you'd make that explicit. So most people discussing discounting uh, don't understand the subject and don't understand the ethical frameworks on which it's based. Um, some people do, um, but it's very important to change that discourse. And anyone who says, what is the discount rate, I put to the bottom of the class because it is absolutely endogenous for this problem. If we destroy the livelihoods of future generations and they become much poorer than <coughs> we are, which is perfectly possible, then the basic theory of discounting would say that at least for a big chunk of the time, discount rate should be negative. But it's endogenous to the problem.